Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Beautiful song tonight. Praise the Lord. Are you ready for God's word tonight? Hallelujah. Well, you folks are going to get whatever I got left tonight. <laughs> After working all day and uh, barely having enough time, to, I stood in the kitchen and ate my soup. Sister Myers heated up for me, my few little Doritos. And uh, I was running right at the hair of a time to get out the door. I think I got here two minutes before church was supposed to start. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Anyhow, but praise God. I'm going to give you whatever I got left tonight. Most of all, I'm going to give what I got left to the Lord. Amen. If you got Matthew tonight in your Bible, would you turn and find that fella? You might turn and find old, uh, that man of God, Matthew, in the Bible. It's the New Testament. Those of y'all wondering, it's not anywhere near Genesis, and it ain't it ain't real close to Revelation. So Matthew chapter twenty five, and there's one verse tonight that I want you to keep highlighted in your memory, and that's going to be verse ten. So Matthew twenty five and ten, but we're going to read this chapter. We're going to start with verse one. We're going to read through to verse thirteen, and this is not brand new ground for many of you. Some of you have heard it preached before. As a matter of fact, I've preached on it numerous times through the years, uh, but this is where the Lord's led me tonight, and so I'm going to try to obey God with this and preach what I feel is on my heart. If you got it, say amen. All right. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. I want to be wise about you. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And I want you to read this tonight, I want you to look closely because for a few days now, this has been going through my mind over and over. Has anyone ever had like a certain line of a song run through your mind? Brother Eric and I were working together, and I asked him one day, I said, Brother, he said, Yeah, preacher. I said, Can you sing another part of that song? All I heard all day long was, we can skin a book, we can run a trot line. I heard that about a million times. We can skin a book, and we can run a trot line. I said, ain't there another part to that song? Come on now. Uh, but uh, I'm telling you, this verse has been going through my mind, but this one part is the part I want you to read. You ready? And they that were ready went in. Read that again. And they that were ready went in. That just has been with me for days. They went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, 
I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. He said to watch there because of all of this, watch. Because you don't ever know when the Lord is coming. You don't know. I don't know. That big name preacher on TV or YouTube don't know. Nobody knows the day or the hour when the Lord's going to come. So you better be watching. This is what I want to preach tonight with God's help on they that be ready. We read there in that 10th verse where the Bible, 10th verse, where it said that they that were ready went in. But I'd like to preach tonight with the help of the Lord on they that be ready. Will you bow your head one more time and let's say another word of prayer over this message. Father, tonight as we come before you, we've prayed already in this service, but right now, God, we're asking you expressly to smile down upon the word of God that is about to be preached. I pray that you'll help us to receive exactly the way that you intended it to be received. Lord, if there be someone listening online, video, audio, tonight, another time, someone here in this service, I pray, God, let this message provoke, let this message stir up something in them that they will want to draw close. Tighten all the loose ends, batten down the hatches, throw the anchor overboard or whatever they need to do to be sure that they are ready. And we'll praise you and everyone can say, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight. I want to ask you a question in getting started. I I want to first tell you that I have preached from this text so many times and probably to this same group of people, some of the same folks online, maybe have heard me preach about being ready and preached about the five wise and five foolish virgins and such as that. So I'm not going to elaborate tonight as much on the details of the story because most all of us, we're pretty familiar with these details about how foolish five of the virgins were and how that they were all a representation of pure in heart people who were saved and washed in the blood of Jesus and they were looking for the appearing of the bridegroom. We all know all of those details, most of us do. So I'm going to skip over just some of that, and if you'd like to hear more of it, just look through. You'll find a message somewhere online that I've preached about it. But for tonight, I'd like to start off by asking you something to to get your mind going just a little bit. And I'd like to say tonight or ask you, have you ever had a time before that you were caught off guard, that you were not ready? Have you ever had an unexpected guest stop by? Somebody who knocked on your door, there you were sitting in your pajamas, you had uh, Coke bottles and water bottles sitting all, come on now, sitting on the end table and you had your feet propped up and one sock on and one sock off and, you know, watching Andy Griffith on the TV or what, I don't know what y'all do at your house, you know, but there you were, you were sitting back, kicking back, relaxing, the couch is covered with dog fur and I don't know what else. I don't know what's going on in your house. Sink full of dishes, laundry on the couch, and there's a knock on the door, and it's somebody that you you were not expecting. Have you ever had that happen? Raise your hand. And you're thinking, you you ever had that happen? And you thought, oh, my goodness, I was not expecting them to stop by. And then you know what we do? We do the mad dash. You have never thrown laundry on your bed in your bedroom faster. You've never tried to straighten things quicker. And so now you've left the old fellow standing at the door while you're running around the house trying to get everything to get. You ever done that? Come on now. Just be honest tonight. There'd be no shame in the game. I've been there before. I've had to be my wife and say, you didn't tell me they were coming by. So I didn't know they was coming by. I didn't know either. We're, that makes two of us. I didn't know they was coming by. You know, that's one thing I don't miss about living on, in a parsonage on the church ground. Because sometimes you live in a parsonage on church ground, people think they have all access to you at all hours of the day. Anytime they want to come, it's like somehow or another, you know what I'm saying. But that's a whole other story right there. But anyway, you've ever been caught off guard. You know what that feels like. You understand 
that to be caught off guard means that I am not ready. Am I right? It means that I'm not looking for you to show up. And there's a lot to be said about that tonight because I want your mind to understand that it is very well possible that not just a visitor that shows up at the front door of your residence, but there is going to come an hour that the Bible talks about when Jesus is going to come back for the church and we that are ready are going to go with Jesus. Do you know that tonight? And the truth is, I'm afraid that there's a lot of folks, some of them are even sitting on church pews on Sunday morning here and there, and they are not ready to meet the Lord. You know, on the way to church tonight, I began to think in my mind about how the Bible has commended us. Jesus has tried to prepare us and make ready that we are going to be ready for the return of the Lord by giving us passages in the Bible talking about how that when the days of the Lord are, when Jesus comes, are going to be like the days of Noah. Whenever that they were prepared, he was preparing for an ark, and the people weren't ready. They were not ready. And, and the Lord shut the ark door, and they were still not ready. They were mocking and they they were still not ready. And he said, just as it was as it, in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And so I thought about that and I thought, you know, the truth is, is that there are a lot of folks uh, that are just not ready for the coming of the Lord. And But I want you to understand that when we say the coming of the Lord, a lot of times people just, uh, they focus in on on the fact that Jesus is supposed to come in the sky and rapture the church away. But what I want you to see tonight that is when the Bible talks about a readiness to meet the Lord, I want you to think of it like this. I want to be ready to meet God. Not just ready for the rapture. I want to be ready to meet God. God. And why is that important tonight? I'll tell you why. Because you may not ever go in the rapture. You might go before the rapture ever gets here. You might be sitting at a traffic light waiting on you know, some, the light to turn green and about the time it turns green you put your foot on that little a rectangular pedal on the right side and you begin to ease forward in the intersection and somebody not paying attention comes out of nowhere and you your life is snuffed out into eternity and there you are either ready or not ready to meet God. So what I want you to see tonight, it's not just uh, thinking, well, I'll get ready when the hour gets close. Uh, because we know the Bible tells us that the, no man knows the day or the hour. But I do believe that most of us understand uh, that by the signs of the times uh, that we'll be able to see that the season is drawing near. That's why the Lord said just like it is when you understand the story of the fig tree and you know that it's season. When the season is coming. Now you don't know when the day is coming, when the Lord will come, but you might understand the season. And I'm afraid that there are some people that got it all wrong. And I'll explain why I mean that, or what I'm saying. Years ago, before I gave my life to God, I had this strange understanding that what I would do is I just live however I wanted to live. Half hazard, you know, not really serving God. I believe that there was a God, but but I wasn't really willing to sell out and quit my mess. And so in my mind, this is my idea of how I was going to serve God. The day that I thought that the Lord might come, that I'd fall down on my knees and I'd pray and ask God to forgive me. As a matter of fact, when the Lord was trying to get my attention, I remember several years ago, right whenever the Lord was dealing with me and I was about to get saved, that I remember having a dream one night. And in that dream, I can just shorten, give you the condensed version. In that dream, amen, there were all sorts of bombs going off. And there were all sorts of wars and things going on. And I remember looking out the window. I ran to the window and Brother Eric, I looked out and the first thing came to my 
mind was uh, is that the rapture must be about to take place. Uh, and so I turned around, ran into the living room in my dream, uh, and just about the time that I was about to fall on my knees, uh, the trumpet sounded, and guess what? I was not ready. I believe tonight that was the Spirit of God uh, trying to let me know uh, you can't live like that because in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, uh, the Bible tells a dead in Christ uh, are gonna rise and we which are alive uh, and remain are gonna be caught up to meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, what does that mean for you and me? That means uh, you're not gonna be able to process uh, faster than the blink of an eye, uh, faster than the crack of a gun, uh, faster than a speeding bullet. Uh, amen, the Lord's gonna come and get the church uh, just like that. Uh, if you think you're going to have a deathbed repentance. I wouldn't bank on that if I were you. If you think you're going to fall down at the last minute and pray and beg God, amen, by the time you think it, the rapture will already be over with. Somebody say, God help me to be ready to meet God. Can you say amen? Am I preaching too hard for Thursday night? Amen, I'll tell you tonight that the truth is we have got to be ready to meet God, not just in the raptures. Everybody got that? I want you to be ready to meet God uh, if you get stage four cancer and you die within a few days and don't even know how bad you were off. Uh, I want you to be ready uh, if you're riding down the road in some drug cartel chasing each other and a stray bullet strikes you uh, and you're dead just like that. I want you to be ready uh, if you're riding down the road driving uh, and a brain aneurysm takes place and you crash into a telephone pole and die I want you to be ready no matter what takes place or if you're sitting on a park bench waiting on a bus I don't know and the rapture takes place I want you to be ready to meet God can you say man oh we gotta be if you believe you ought to be ready to meet God say man because there is going to be an unexpected guest that one day is gonna show up at the doorstep of your soul. You are not going to have time to put the dirty laundry away. You're, come on, you should have done that already in the altar. You should have already prayed and repented and made it right. You're not going to have, my God, I'm beginning to feel like preaching tonight. I feel my help tonight. Hey Amen. You're not going to have time to make your wrongs right. You're not going to have time to pay back money that you know that you owe. You're not going to be able to make apologies. You're either going to be ready when that trumpet sounds or you ain't. Can you say amen tonight? You're either going to be ready or not when that knock at the door comes and he's standing at the door knocking and he's ready to bring you on home when it's your, di your dying time or if it's rapture time. No matter what time that it might be, you better make sure you're ready. I mean, he says tonight, God, I want to be ready. I want to be ready when he comes. I'm afraid that we don't put enough emphasis on the fact of being ready in this hour. I remember being saved early on in the years I got saved. I'm telling you that the church was always preaching about the coming, the soon come of the king, coming of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Why? Because the church of that day wanted everybody to be ready because you just never know what you may face. The Bible says you never know what a day may bring. You may get up and not know it and that be your last day. Have you ever known anybody that they got up in the morning and they went about their day and chances are they never thought today might be my last day here. Huh? I remember whatever it was two, three years ago my son asked me and my wife to pray for him. He was working at a hospital and uh, doing security there and he had called us and he said there was a young man, I think he said he was about 21 or something like that, and this young man was working on a construction crew, if I understood correctly, and somehow or another, late at night, the fella got ran over, I think, by a dump truck, 
And my son said, I've got to go up to that floor and uh, I've got to go up there and collect some of his belongings for the family or something like that. I don't remember the details. I just know a young man got ran over by a dump truck. And I remember what Devin said to me. He said, Dad, and this is the way I think, which is strange to me because I think like this. He said, Dad, as I stood there and looked, I thought, you know, I looked down at his socks and I looked at the clothes that he had on and he said, I thought to myself, you know, when he was getting ready for work today, he probably never thought this will be the last pair of socks I ever wear. This will be the last pair of pants I ever put on. This will be the last shirt that I ever put on my body because I'm checking out tonight. He probably never thought that. Hey Amen, I'm telling you, that's probably the reason why that granny used to say, make sure you got on clean drawers. Come on now. Because you just never know, buddy, when you're going to be headed out into eternity. Eternity. And I'm here to tell you, you might get up tomorrow morning uh, and you might put on your blue and purple striped socks uh, and put on your little Crocs uh, and put on whatever you put on uh, and not realize uh, that'll be the last time you put clothes on that deathly dying body because that day you're going to die. You may never know uh, or it might be that you're going to get caught up by the way of the rapture halfway through the day. But I tell you one thing, baby, you better to make sure that you make things right between you and God. You may not hear this kind of preaching much anymore, but you'll hear it for a little while tonight. Amen. Maybe that's why we're not packing out auditoriums over here at Old Gray Street. I'm not sure. All I know is I've been doing everything I can to preach the gospel true and straight and exactly as the Bible has, has explained it to us. But there are two elements tonight. I don't plan to preach a really long time, but there are two elements tonight that went through my mind when God put this in my heart. You see, these five wise and five foolish virgins teach us a lot about the readiness, being ready to meet the bridegroom when he comes. And one of the things that I saw when I looked at this is a certain sense of readiness. And that's why that this particular verse or whatever just kept running through my mind, verse 10, that they that were ready went in. So the people that actually made it were the ones that were ready. They that were ready went in. To say that those that were ready means that some folks were not if the ones that were ready went in, that also at the same time means those that were not ready did not go in. And we cannot avoid that. Why is that important? Because we live in a super hyper generation of love, love, love. And I believe God is a God of love, but some folks believe it like you could be a crack addict and a drug dealer and a rap star and sing and preach or whatever you do of the most vulgar, foul stuff there is. And somehow, if you drive a drug over dose, you're going to wake up in the portals of glory and the preacher's going to preach you into heaven. Nobody can preach you into heaven. You're either ready or you're not ready. Say amen. You're not going to live wrong and die right. You hear me? You are not going to live wrong and die right. I'm just telling you there's got to be a readiness. They that are ready, they that were ready went in. There are two elements. The first is anticipation, and the other one is expectation, or the other one is preparation. Anticipation and preparation. As I began to pray and meditate on what God had laid on my heart, I thought about the anticipation. It is a certain sense of readiness in the mind when we anticipate something. Some of you that watch a lot of reels or Videos, you've probably have stumbled across a video like this before. Have you ever seen these videos where that some soldier has gone off to Iraq or someplace and he's been gone for several months, sometimes a really long time, and there at the airport is his parents waiting in the wings of the airport for their son to come home. You ever seen these videos where the soldiers come home and they got a little girl and a mommy? 
you know, families there, they're waiting and they got tears and they got signs up. They're standing in the airport. You know what they're doing as they watch airplanes landing? They're wondering, you know, which one of those is my daddy on? Which one of those is my husband on coming over here from Iraq? They are anticipating him showing up in that airport. Every time that another group of people walk through that the, the wing of that airport, they're looking, they're anticipating. And as they're looking, can you imagine if you hadn't seen your son? or you hadn't seen your husband in a long time, the way you would feel and that level of anticipation as you watch people filing off, you're going to be looking for some semblance or resemblance of that person that you're looking for. With anticipation, you're looking and you're thinking they should have already come out by now. Oh, I don't see them. Wait, is that him? Oh, no, that's not him. Wait, wait, was that, is that, that him? Maybe that's him. I think that's him in the back. No, that's not him. And all of a sudden, no, wait, my Mom, I think I see my dad. He's back there. Oh, yeah, baby, that, that, that's him right there. And the reason is, is because they are anticipating with a certain level of readiness. They are ready to meet him and greet him when he could, gets off of that airplane. I wonder tonight, uh, as a church, a, as a whole, and individually, are we anticipating uh, just like those soldiers' wives uh, who are waiting on their soldier to come off the airplane and they're looking, is that him? Uh, is it today? Could it be today? That feels like him. It seems like him. Are we standing on the shores watching that eastern sky anticipating that today might be the day? Hey Amen. I don't know when it's going to be, but I'm ready to meet him when that time comes. There's got to be a readiness in the mind and anticipation. I've, I feel like that there's a lot of folks that are like that that person who's running around scurrying, trying to get the laundry off the couch and put it in their bedroom, dump it on the bed or whatever they do, or throw stuff in the closet, shut the door, you know. I feel like there's a lot of church folks like that, people that claim to be Christians like that, that are not ready. They're not, not, they're not ready for the unexpected guest that's coming at midnight. But then there's other folks. They've been anticipating that there would be a knock at the door. They didn't know when. But they were anticipating. They said, well, you know what? I didn't know what day you would show up at my house. But I knew it would be sometime. So I've already got the laundry folded. And it's, I've already got the floor swept and mopped. I've been doing that now for six and a half years, preacher. And he ain't came yet. Keep sweeping. Keep mopping. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Keep sweeping and keep mopping. Keep folding that spiritual laundry. You got what I'm saying? Because one of these days, there'll be a knock. Figuratively speaking, there's going to be a trumpet that's going to sound. And I'm telling you, God's coming for his church. And if he don't come for you by the way of the rapture, it could be by the way of the grave. And you want to make sure that when that time comes that I'm not running around trying to do last minute, hey amen, pick this up, fix that up, make this apology, pay that money back, to pray and ask God to forgive me for some loose end stuff. If there's any loose ends, honey, take care of them. Don't ever let the sun go down on unrepented sin. You can't afford to go to bed on unrepented sin. You never know what will happen to you while you're laying there in that bed. Am I right, Brother Eric? And if you didn't have mom and sister in the other room, check on you. When you was going into one of them diabetic moments or comas or whatever it is you have, and then call 911 to get them uh, EMTs in there, get you to the hospital. You probably lay there and die. The other night, my wife is laying beside me, and I'm laying there, and I can't sleep. We do this to each other all the time, you know. Matter of fact, the other night, she recorded me snoring. Her turn's coming. But I was laying in the bed the other day, and she was laying on her back. And usually, Sister Meyer sleeps on her stomach. I don't know why I can't do that. I just feel like, I'm like a, I, want some, I want to be able to breathe, you know what I mean? Who in the world wants to sleep on her stomach? If you do that, bless you. But Sister Meyer's laying on her back, and I don't normally see her laying on her back, but she's laying there, and she's like, 
And I wouldn't hear her breathe for a long time. I started to shake her or something. I don't know, like, are you dying on me or what? I don't hear nothing. And then all of a sudden I hear, <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, help both of us. She did that four times until finally in her half conscious self, I guess she decided, you know what, this ain't working out too well. I better roll on my side. And she rolled on her side, and I got, I'm, I'm still listening. And she's breathing okay now, so I'm like, okay. She's got to figure it out, so we're good. We don't need to go to ER or nothing tonight. And so I got to get up and go to work in the morning, so we're good for tonight. But I'm telling you that because you don't never know whenever you might. <gasps> and that's the last time you ever inhale. My son stayed a night at our house one time, and I went to my wife, and I said, that boy's dying in the living room. She said, do what? I said, he is. He's dying in the living room. You might want to go say last words to him. What in the world are you talking about? I said, I'm telling you, I ain't never, that boy, he needs help. He needs a doctor or something. Why? I said, because it ain't, that's not normal to sound like that when you're sleeping. I mean, it sounds like a Kirby vacuum and a car with a muffler half off or something. That is not normal. And I sound, I, I could snore now, let me tell you something, but that's just, I don't know what he was doing in there, but he sounded like he was about to suck his nostrils down in his esophagus. And when you're sleeping like that, and you don't, you don't know, you may not wake up. I'm just trying to help you to understand. Now, it might be a little bit of good humor, because you know Pastor Meyer's crazy like that. But listen to me. I'm being serious. You don't ever know. You don't ever know. Let me share this with you. My Aunt Ann, she may listen to this, I don't know, but my dear Aunt Ann... <laughs> When I did my Uncle David's funeral, I said, that's Miss Hollywood and Mr. Mrs. Mr. Hollywood, you know. Uh, but she told me, she said, she was laying in the bed. And she said, I, I normally, he gets up at like 4.30 or something, you know. He'll, he'll kind of get woke up. And she said, a lot of times whenever he gets woke up, you know, he'll reach over and he'll bump my hand. You know, like a love tap, let me know, I, I love you, baby. He was just a sweet gentleman. He loved his wife, and I just always admired that. And uh, she said, I felt him bump me. And she said, I thought to myself, you rascal, you up this early in the morning. She said, I looked over, and I said, what are you trying to say to me? And she said, he didn't answer me. She said, David? She said, so I reached over and I grabbed his arm, and she said his arm was real rigid. She said, I knew something was wrong. She said, I ripped the covers back. She said, I pulled him off in the floor and started doing CPR. She said, Joey, she said, I was on the phone with the 911 operator. She said, I did CPR so much. And you got to understand, my, my, my aunt, she's way up in her age. She said, I did CPR so long. She said, I kept thinking in my mind, they're going to come in here, my kids, and everybody's going to come here and find me dead on top of him. She said, I couldn't hardly think, breathe, or nothing. You never know. In an hour when you think not, you just never know. You know, you got to have an anticipation. Anticipating, because it's going to happen. Not just that, but you got to have preparation. It is a readiness of doing things that make ready. When you know there is going to come a time when something is going to happen, you don't do what we call here in the south. You folks from up in the north, Maine, wherever, up there near the Canadian border, you all may not get this, but we call it lollygagging. Okay? So if you don't know what that means, that makes two of us, but we think we know what it means. That means just, you know, being goofy and wasting time. So when you're lollygagging and you ain't paying no attention and you wait to the last minute, let me tell you all a little story about unpreparedness. I wish my daughter was here so I don't have to say this and her and somebody tell her later and say, your dad preaching about you, but this really happened. Sister Myers can vouch for this. While I was pastor in Gray Street, my daughter was historically late 
like real bad late to everything. I called her Grandma Moses. I said, you take longer than anybody I ever seen in my lifetime to get ready. I don't know what in the world you could be possibly doing to take so long. And my wife, like always, she would already go to church, get the air conditioning on, all the church is unlocked. And so I'm there, sometimes one or two of the boys, and it's my responsibility to get them boogers to the church. So I'm standing around there like, come on. Now, I know that you ain't never had this happen. I said, come on. Get your clothes on. Come on. I got to go. Come on. You're going to make me late. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Let's get with it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. And so after a couple of years, and I just finally got tired of that. I told my daughter one day, I said, let me tell you something, Grandma Moses. I said, the next time that it's time for me to leave, I said, I'm going to give you as much time as I can. I said, but next time, I'm leaving. And I will leave you square right here, half ready, by yourself. But dad, this, but dad, I said, but dad, nothing. So one morning, she was almost ready, not quite. I said, I'm ready. I said, I'm going to leave you here. No, you're not going to leave me here. I'm almost ready. I said, I know what almost ready means for you, 20 more minutes. I said, and I'm not going to be late today. So I got my keys, Brother Eric. I walked outside. I got in my vehicle, and I cranked it up. I backed up. I pulled down the driveway. I started to head out the road. She still wasn't nowhere. I got pulled out, was going down the road. The neighborhood looked up in the rearview mirror. Here she come walking out the front door. She called her mom and she said, Mom, Dad left me at the house. I told her, I said, look, Grandma Moza, next time, be ready. Look, what I'm telling you is, is that she would just piddle in this and that and wait till the last minute. I said, girl, lay your clothes out the night before. Do whatever you got to do. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that you don't wait till the last minute to make preparation. When you are ready, that means that you're, if you're going on a long road trip, you don't wait for an hour before the trip. Oh, we might want to pack. Let me tell you something. If Going on a road trip was anything like going to heaven. Sister Myers is going to beat us all there. Because my wife, a week before we're supposed to go somewhere, you got your suitcase packed. It's a week away. What, what do you want me to do? I'll have clothes washed four times between now and then. I mean, what? But you need to pack, don't forget to pack your bag. And so, but I got to be honest, there's been a few times that it's been like right the day before, and I'm up at 12 o'clock at night trying to pack, and we got to leave it in the next morning. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that if you keep putting off doing what you know you're supposed to do, you will not be ready. Is that not the message of the five foolish? That's the reason why. That whenever the cry came at midnight, they were not ready. Because they all slumbered and slept, but five were foolish and they did not have the right amount of oil. Had they have done what they should have before the day got there, they would have had sufficient oil. Stand to your feet tonight. I believe I preached just about every which way I can think of tonight to help you to understand you and I have got to be ready. Sister Miranda's coming to play some get down in the altar and pray kind of music. And uh, while she's doing that, I want you to realize that you and me, all of us, need to make sure we have an anticipation and that we have preparation. And as we think about it, get ready to pray. I'm going to ask you, what have you done to make sure you are ready? In all seriousness tonight, is there any apologies you need to make to anybody? Is there any money you need to, hey man, I'm sorry. Is there anything you need to ask somebody to forgive you? Is there something you've done to somebody and you want to go to them and say, I'm sorry? Is there anything at all that you feel like you need to do to make right or make ready? As I anticipate... I'm like that soldier's family waiting in the airport on their son to come in on that airplane. I know you're coming. 
I don't know the exact minute when that plane's going to land, but I know it's coming. I've already heard the word come across the terminal that you're coming. I've already got the message that you're on your way. Just like you and I have already got the message. He's on his way. He said, well, Pastor Myers, I don't know if the rapture is going to take place in this generation. If it doesn't, you've got to be ready to meet the Lord either way. You're not going to wait till the very last minute and squeak in. It don't work that way. You've got to be ready. Will you take some time tonight, get down on your knees and pray? What if this were the last opportunity you ever had to pray and ask God to help you get ready? What if you were going to go home tonight and be one of those people who had a heart attack in your sleep? Like a fellow that I pastored in Mayaka City, Shad Graber at 47 years old. God rest his soul like Kenny Fitzgerald, Sister Nora's husband. A few years after we had pastored here, who in the middle of the night died sitting in his recliner, found him hard as a rock the next morning. Why? Because death is no respecter of persons, folks. He was 47 years old, too. How old will you be? I want to ask you that question. If you didn't go by the way of the rapture, how old will you be when you do go? Will you be 95? Will you be 16? 34? 83? 72? How old will you be when you make that crossing? 53? 26? 34? I don't know, Pastor. You're right. You don't know. That's why it pays to be ready. Because they that are ready are the ones going in to meet the bridegroom. Let's all pray tonight. God bless you. Lord, we thank you for this service. We thank you for all you've done already, what you're going to do in our lives, God, tonight. Lord, help me and my brother both to be ready for that return of the Lord. I pray tonight, God, that you'll smile down from heaven on my life and on his life, on my children, on my grandchildren tonight, Jesus.